Look, I'm getting these really funny heartbeats. Oh, that's anxiety. Other aspects of lifestyle which may be relevant. Be patient with yourself and just build up gradually. So I just needed to have them work with me. There's a whole bunch of cardiomyopathies. Benefits of doing genetic testing. Take their own heart monitor. There's better types of fat. Try and find a cure for inherited heart muscle diseases. Um, it's, it's a real privilege and pleasure to, to, you know, to be given the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, Cardamopsy UK does lots of wonderful work. Um, I'm very grateful to them. All the patients that I look after are very grateful to them. They do lots of very helpful work, helping us promote our research and, and help our patients huge amounts. So um, it, it's, it's really great to be able to, you know, to, to give something back and speak, speak today. So I spend half my time seeing patients and half my time doing research. My research is predominantly based in, in dilated cardiomyopathy and, and I see patients with all, all different forms of, of, of cardiomyopathy. Um, I'm predominantly based at the Royal Brompton but, but also do some work at Harefield and, and St Thomas's Hospital too. So what is dilated cardiomyopathy? So this is an MRI of, of, of someone's heart with dilated cardiomyopathy and, and I'll, I'll take you through what we're looking at. So um, this is the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of the heart. Okay. Um, and here we see it's thin walled, so the, the walls are thinner th than we'd expect. Um, and the cavity, the white bit in the middle, is bigger than we'd expect. Um, and the pumping function of the muscle, the black stuff, is, is, is reduced. This is the right ventricle, the, the bit of the heart that pumps blood up to the lungs. Okay, and this is also enlarged and also impaired. Okay, so dilated cardiomyopathy essentially is whenever this chamber becomes dilated, enlarged, um, and the pumping function becomes impaired. And often this is a very severe case um, where the pumping function is very severely reduced. And, and in severe cases, we can also get involvement of the right ventricle. We also see the collecting chambers, the atria here, are enlarged, and that's because the pressure in the ventricles is increased. And it's, the heart is essentially just like a big pump. It's, you know, it's plumbing. And if the pressure rises in the left ventricle, then that gets transmitted back into the atria and they become stretched too. Um, so it's, it's essentially weakness of the heart muscle, predominantly the left ventricle. And it is weakness that is not caused by coronary artery disease. Okay, so narrowing of the blood supply to the heart muscle or high blood pressure. Okay, so... If someone presents predominantly with high blood pressure or with narrowings of their heart arteries or after a heart attack, then these are alternative causes for someone's heart muscle to become weak. It can get a little bit tricky because there may be more than one cause for someone's heart weakness, and we're beginning to recognize this more and more. So it, it is possible that people can have more than one of these things. So who does it affect? And to be honest, we don't really know how many people it affects worldwide, but most recent estimates, and, and these are community-wide population estimates from, from big population cohorts. So in this country, there's something called the UK Biobank, which recruited hundreds of thousands of patients from the community and did lots of investigations on them. Um, and, and from this, um, some people in, in our research group have estimated that the prevalence of the number of people with it in the populations, about one in 220. Okay, so there's always a bit of a debate whether this is more common than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I think it depends who you ask and, and what the favourite cardiomyopathy of the person you ask is. But I, I think that this probably is the, 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 the most common cardiomyopathy that, that, that there is out there. It seems to affect men about twice as commonly as women. And the more we look into sex differences between men and women with dilated cardiomyopathy, the more we find. And this is an important area of research that we need to understand more about. And it may be that we need to treat men and women with dilated cardiomyopathy in, 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 you know, with different tools and, and personalise the treatment to the disease that they have. And it can affect anyone at any stage of their life. So young babies are born with it. 
Okay, they can be born with very severe disease, um, and and it affects people right up until the ages of 80 and 90. And, and we diagnose people for the first time, you know, who are in their eighth and ninth decade of life. Okay, so it can affect anyone at any stage, and anyone is anyone can be vulnerable to it. The typical patient that we would diagnose with it would be someone in their 40s or 50s. And it is still a major problem, so it is still the most common indication for someone having a heart transplant around the world. Um, and it's a common reason why people also have left ventricular assist devices put in or, or heart pumps. Now, fortunately, the vast, 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 vast majority of people do not require a heart transplant. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in, in a few slides. So, what causes it? Okay. And I think when patients come to us and we diagnose them with dilated cardiomyopathy, patients want to know what causes it. And as doctors, we want to be able to describe the cause of it. And I think it is not always so easy. And I think in the past, perhaps we have tried to, to, to make a guess of what has caused it, because it makes us feel good that we know what's going on, and it makes the patient feel comfortable that we knew what caused their problem. But, but I, I, I think it is often more difficult to determine the cause than, than one might expect. And I think for the vast majority of patients, it's a mixture of nature and nurture. Okay? And by nature, I mean intrinsic genetic susceptibility, so changes in our genes that we were born with. And then nurture, so things that happen to us after birth, sometimes that we can control and then other times that we can't control, so acquired conditions. And the genetic intrinsic susceptibility that we have can be due to a single spelling mistake in a single gene that has a very, very large effect to produce disease by itself. And this happens probably in about 20% of people with dilated cardiomyopathy. And then probably more commonly, it's not just one single spelling mistake in, in one single gene that has a huge effect, but lots of small spelling mistakes in genes that each have a, a, a very small effect, but when you add them all together, they, they act to increase someone's susceptibility. And this is something that we call polygenic susceptibility. And we're learning more about this. And then the things that happen to us in the environment, so drinking too much alcohol, viruses that we encounter day to day, why do some people get inflammation of their heart? Why do some people get affected by viruses? Um, we all have viral infections during our life, and it may be that some people are more susceptible to them. Also toxins, so things that doctors give, things that we give. Chemotherapy is, is, is one of the most common things. Chemotherapy is obviously a, a life-saving treatment that needs to be given. And sometimes we need to weigh up the, the balance of risks and benefits with different types of chemotherapy and monitor the heart to make sure that we can get someone through life-saving chemotherapy and, and, and manage their heart through it. And then pregnancy is also um, a, a relatively uncommon one, but, but obviously still a very important one. So pregnancy is, is a marathon for the heart, and in, in women who are susceptible to developing dilated cardiomyopathy, pregnancy may unmask it, and, and pregnancy may also um, um, uh, cause specific processes that, that put extra stress on the heart. So how do people present? Well, people might present with shortness of breath, okay, and, and, and that is typically due to heart failure. Heart, and I'll talk a little bit about the overlap between heart failure and dilated cardiomyopathy on the next slide. They may present with heart rhythm problems, palpitations, blackouts, syncope, um, because, um, because heart rhythms um, uh, disturb the amount of blood that, that can travel up to the head, and... and um, we are sinkable because um, we don't get enough oxygen. It can also be because we have investigations for other things, and, and we diagnose more and more people almost coincidentally. Someone has a scan because they have high blood pressure, and we find that actually their heart is weak, or they present with palpitation and, and, or, or undergo a, a health check and have scans for these reasons, and we diagnose them coincidentally almost. We also diagnose more and more people through family screening. Okay, so this is a family tree. The person in blue is, is a man. He's married with two children and has two sisters. Um, 
And if this man presents with dilated cardiomyopathy, knowing that there may be intrinsic genetic susceptibility to it, we often recommend screening of first degree relatives. So we screen his two sisters and diagnose one of them with dilated cardiomyopathy. We might do genetic testing and find that the, um, the, the patient carries a spelling mistake in a gene that we think is the cause of the problem. We test his sister and also find that she carries the same gene. And we may be able to offer predictive testing, so to predict the risk uh, of his uh, daughter's developing disease, we may be able to offer them the genetic test to see whether they also carry the spelling mistake. So we may diagnose more and more people um, earlier in disease and even before they develop disease. So heart failure and dilated cardiomyopathy, and I think there, there can be some confusion around this, um, I, I, and I think this Venn diagram hopefully gives a bit of an insight into the relationship. So, so heart failure is a clinical syndrome. It's a collection of signs and symptoms that are caused by abnormal heart function. So it can not only just be caused by a weak heart pump, it can be caused by a stiff heart pump, by problems with the valves, by uh, changes in the heart rhythm. So there are lots of different causes of which dilated cardiomyopathy is one. It's not a single disease. Dilated cardiomyopathy really describes the appearance of the heart. It describes dilatation of the heart chambers and reduced pumping function. Okay, um, And not everyone with dilated cardiomyopathy will have heart failure. Okay, not everyone will have a collection of signs and symptoms because the heart is inefficient. The collection of signs and symptoms are typically shortness of breath, fluid retention and fatigue. And many patients who we diagnose with dilated cardiomyopathy will not have these symptoms because either we've caught the disease early or they've responded very well to treatment. So what tests do we use to diagnose dilated cardiomyopathy? The ECG, the heart trace, um, in the top left, um, this is a, you know, the first invest investigation that, that patients tend to get whenever they come to see a heart doctor or, or often their GP with a heart problem. And this can give us some hints towards the presence of, of, of a cardiomyopathy. A rhythm monitor, particularly if patients are presenting with palpitation, um, where they, you know, I'm sure many of you will have, have had one where you wear the holder monitor for 24, 48 hours. This allows us to look for, for uh, changes in the heart rhythm and potentially dangerous uh, changes in the heart rhythm. If people are presenting with shortness of breath, we can often put them on a treadmill to see how much exercise they can do, to see how their heart responds to exercise. And it can also give us a guide whenever we're giving exercise advice about how much exercise they should do. So I think a treadmill test can be helpful, particularly if someone wants to do exercise and we want to give them exercise advice. An echocardiogram, which is the middle image, okay, this is an ultrasound scan of the heart. And again, this tends to be the first investigation that you get as an imaging test because it's easily available and simple to do. MRI scan on the right, okay. This gives us nicer images. It allows us to more accurately assess the function of the heart. It gives us very precise measurements, very reproducible measurement. And, and perhaps most importantly, it also allows us to look for scar in the heart muscle, okay. So I like to do lots of MRI because I'm an MRI enthusiast. I work in a hospital or hospitals where we've got lots of access to MRI. Um, there is still inequity in access across the country. Um, so where there is less availability, we have to prioritise the circumstances where we may um, get, get the most information from MRI. I, I think typically the, the best time to do an MRI is at the time of diagnosis to give us more information about the, uh, about the possible cause of dilated cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. So in this image on the right, we see black healthy muscle and down the middle wall of the heart we see a big white stripe okay and this white stripe is scar in the heart okay and the presence of scar and the pattern of scar can give us an indication of what might have caused it okay can give us an indication of the risk of dangerous heart rhythms in the future um, patients with lots of scar in their heart may be at increased risk of dangerous heart rhythms and this can help guide um, when we might use things like defibrillators in the future. And it can also give us an indication of whether someone's had a silent heart attack in the past, which is more frequent than, than one might imagine. Okay. So genetic testing. So I, I think there's huge interest in genetic testing and, and when we should do it. 
Um, I, again, I, I think there is inequity in access in genetic testing across the country, and this is something that you know I know the charity are, are, are working to, to try to deal with, and, and there's lots of effort to try to improve access and make sure that the patients who will gain the most from it um, are, are able to are able to get it. So at the moment we've got national testing guidelines. Um, and in an ideal world, I think we would test everyone with cardiomyopathy would have a genetic test. But at the moment, we don't have the services to be able to deliver that. It's a limited resource. Genetic testing is a difficult thing to deliver. It takes a very long time to, for us to interpret the results to perform the, to perform the genetic sequencing. So the, the national testing guidelines have identified different groups of patients who are most likely to have genetic forms of disease, and, and they suggest that these are the patients that we should prioritise for testing at the moment. So those patients that present young, below the age of 50, those that present with slow heart rhythms, cardiac conduction disease, and that's because particular genetic forms of the disease can, can also present with slow heart rhythms. If they have lots of ventricular ar arrhythmias, arrhythmias coming from the bottom of the heart, um, or if, 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 if someone's sadly passed away suddenly and unexpectedly, and we diagnose dilated cardiomyopathy in a post-mortem examination, then we would advocate doing genetic testing um, on, on tissue retained from the post-mortem, and that's so that we can inform the risk of surviving family members um, about them possibly in, inheriting the same, um, the, the, the same problem. So it is a limited resource, um, and at the moment we're trying to identify those that will get the most benefit from it um, and, and um, prioritise them. As I said, I think in 10 years' time, hopefully, we'll be able to offer it to all patients um, and, and um, you know, in, in a standardised way. So, so what are the benefits of, of doing genetic testing? Well, it's primarily to identify family members who also may be at risk. So in this family that I talked about earlier, it's about trying to identify the risk in the children of this family and also the children of these two families as well, potentially. So this is something called cascade genetic testing. So this is whenever we will cascade test um, um, the first three relatives of, of, of the people who carry the spelling mistake in the gene. I think we're also more and more using the results of genetic test to, to guide treatment and specifically to guide the use of implantable defibrillators. So we know that there's a spectrum of risk depending on the types of uh, uh, genetic change that you might have. So, so this is a kind of current interpretation of some of the genes up here on the top and, and the risk that might be associated with them. So some of them are associated with higher risk and in, in patients who carry these spelling mistakes in, in, in these specific genes, then we may be, um, you know, implant defibrillators at an earlier stage. It's also important to guide reproductive options. Okay, so if um, young patients are aiming to start a family, then we can talk them through the different reproductive options that there are um, um, to, 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 to try to minimise the risk of, of, of any children developing disease in the future and, and, and discuss the best way forward for them. And that might include, in some situations, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And that's whenever we do in vitro fertilization and we implant embryos that do not have the spelling mistake in the gene that we think causes cardiomyopathy. And that is best used in specific circumstances and it is, you know, it's not the right thing for everyone. And just as we have Mavicampton for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a disease-specific therapy, I think in the next five years, we will also have gene-specific therapies for dilated cardiomyopathy. So I think if you, if you have a specific genetic form of the disease, we will be able to offer treatment that targets um, um, the disease process that causes it. And we're currently involved in some clinical trials looking at these types of therapies. And, and I think there is lots of excitement around this area. So what are the chances of relatives developing the disease? And I think this is something that we, you know, we, we should think about and, and, and also try to estimate which relatives we should, we should start screening and, and, and how frequently. 
So for monogenic disease, this is disease caused by a single spelling mistake in a single gene that has a very large effect to produce the disease by itself. So if you have children, 50% of, off, of, of the offspring will, will have the same spelling mistake, or there's a 50% chance of, of all, the offspring um, carrying the same spelling mistake in the gene. But it's also possible that not all of those offspring who carry the, the spelling mistake in the gene will develop the disease. And that's because single spelling mistakes and single genes are expressed very differently by different people. Okay. And that's something called variable penetrance. And if we don't find a gene or we suspect that there might be lots of dif different genes, each with a very small effect contributing to the disease, the risk of first degree relatives developing the disease is likely to be a lot lower than 50%. And there was this interesting study recently from America which suggested that if you have dilated cardiomyopathy, your first degree relatives will have about a 30% chance at some point in their life of developing some reduction in their heart function. Okay? So this is taking everyone with dilated cardiomyopathy and trying to estimate the risk of a relative developing some changes in their heart function at some point in their life. And I say some changes in their heart function. This may be subtle. It may not have any clinical significance. Many of these patients may be well with, 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 without knowing that they have a problem or ever develop a clinical problem. So what about medical therapy? So I, I think this is a slide that I like to use to explain the aims of, of heart failure therapy, okay? So heart failure therapy is generic therapy used for people with reduced heart function. And I think if we think of our heart as a donkey, okay, and the donkey is carrying a heavy load, okay, and the donkey is tired, it is out of fuel. Um, and there are different ways that we can try to take work off the donkey and, and, and make it happier. And one of those is to reduce the load, okay, to ask the donkey to do less work. Okay. And we use therapies like ACE inhibitors, Sucubidrol Valsartan or Entresto, Spironolactone, Milleralocorticoid Receptor Antagonist, a Plerinone, to reduce the load that the heart has to work against. Okay. So this essentially lowers blood pressure, it takes um, work off the kidneys by acting on different hormone systems that are activated in heart failure. We can also reduce the speed that we ask the donkey to walk at. And that's essentially what beta blockers do. Beta blockers slow the heart down and, and ask it to do less work that way. And the other thing that we could do is try to give the donkey more fuel. Okay? And this is something that SGLT2 inhibitors may do, although if we're completely honest, we don't quite know how SGLT2 inhibitors work. Mm -hmm. And they may work by lots of different mechanisms. So these are your medications like dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. Okay, so the cornerstone of management of symptomatic dilated cardiomyopathy with heart failure are these four medications. So ACE inhibitors or Entresto, beta blockers, um, a plerinone or spironolactone, and then SGLT2 inhibitors. Okay, so if you have an ejection fraction less than 40% with symptoms of heart failure, being on all four of these medications rather than just one or two, will add an average of about six years to a typical 55-year-old patient's life. Okay. So if you have symptoms of heart failure with reduced pumping function, these are very important medications. And very important people are heart failure nurses and heart failure pharmacists who do a super, super job in um, looking after patients, making sure they're on the best types of medications for themselves and, and, and working with patients to, 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 to get the combination right. If you don't have symptoms of heart failure or, or your left ventricle is less impaired, then it becomes a little bit less certain which medications are best and when you should start them. And this is because we don't have the studies in earlier forms of the disease. And we do need these types of studies. I, I think if you are asymptomatic without symptoms, most people will put you on at least some of these medications because we think that this will take work off the heart and prevent you from developing heart failure in the future. 
There's some other medications that we can add in in specific circumstances, but these are less important generally. For specific people, we may offer defibrillators to reduce the risk of, um, for, from dangerous heart rhythms and of sudden death. We can use cardiac resynchronization therapy, a pacemaker, to try to make the heart um, more efficient. I'll talk a little bit about these in, 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 in just a moment. I think the important thing is that these medications really deal with the heart failure syndrome. They deal with the consequences of reduced heart function. Okay, so we're really put, trying to put the fire out after it started. And I think what we would rather do is stop the fire from starting. So treat people at an earlier stage of their disease before they develop heart failure. And I think we are seeing a group of therapies on the horizon that we may be able to use to do this. Okay, early diagnosis is obviously key. But as we use cascade screening and clinical screening of family members, we will identify more and more people with earlier forms of the disease that we might be able to target. Okay? And this includes the gene therapies that, that some of you may have uh, um, read about. So these really target the cause of the disease rather than the consequence, which is impaired heart function. So implantable defibrillators, so these are either two different types a transvenous one, okay, transvenous one is like a, a, a traditional pacemaker, sits under the left collarbone, one or two or three leads go into the vein and they sit inside the heart. Um, more recently, we've we started to use subcutaneous defibrillators, so these don't sit inside the veins, sit um, in the left armpit and have a lead that just sits on top of the breastbone. Okay, and there's advantages and disadvantages of, of either one, and I think, you know, it is really a discussion between ourselves and the patient about the advantages and disadvantages of them that, that, that should lead to an informed choice about the type of defibrillator that's right for, a, you know, for, right for the individual in front of us. So the ones that sit inside the veins. Um, have been used for many years, so we've used them for 30 years more. Um, and they can pace the heart, okay, as, as, as well as deliver a shock for a dangerous heart rhythm. The disadvantage is that the leads sit inside um, the veins in the heart, and, and over a lifetime that can cause um, an increased risk of, of, of problems and make it more difficult to remove the defibrillator if, if, if a problem occurs. The disadvantage with the subcutaneous device is that it's a newer one. We haven't been using it as long, so we don't know as much about it in the long term, and it can't pace the heart. But the advantage is that the leads sit outside the heart. So which patient should have a defibrillator? And, and this is a very difficult question, and, and you know, our perspective on things changes and is a dynamic thing. Okay. What we want to do is pick a patient where the risks of having a defibrillator are outweighed by the possible benefits. We want to pick patients who are at the highest risk of having a dangerous heart rhythm and, and who may gain benefit from one of these. So the types of factors that we take into account. So if someone has severe heart dysfunction despite being on medications for a period of time, if someone has specific forms of genetic disease that may be at a higher risk of a dangerous heart rhythm, if someone has lots of scar in their heart, and generally it is patients that will otherwise live a long time with the disease um, if they were not to succumb to sudden death. So a one-size-fits-all approach does not work, and again this is an individual decision that sh should be between the patient and the doctor looking after them. So what about cardiac resynchronization therapy? Cardiac resynchronization therapy is a pacemaker with three leads, okay, and um, leads on the left and the right side of the heart. Um, and we use that whenever we see particular electrical patterns on the ECG. And these particular electrical patterns can cause discoordinate motion of the heart, okay. It can cause the heart to become out of sync Okay. And if we're able to resynchronize the heart by pacing both sides of the heart together, we can make it more efficient. So maybe there's been lots of doom and gloom, but I think the good news is that lots and lots of patients get better with the medications that we give them, and they do not need 
any of these more advanced therapies. So our, one of our recent studies suggested that as many as two-thirds of patients will get very significant improvements in their heart function within their first year of being started on therapy. So this is what I like to think of as an, of an, an, as an uh, escalator of improvement. Okay? So patients often present down at the bottom of the escalator with symptoms of heart failure. They get put on medications and many of them reach different levels. Okay? So many patients will get back to feeling normal, having a good quality of life, being able to do all the things that they want to do. And our jobs as clinicians is, is, is trying to help them achieve their goals in, 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 in doing so. The bad news is that even if you do have resolution of your symptoms and your heart function returns to normal, as, as perhaps maybe a third or 40% of patients will do, you, you probably do need to stay on some medications at least um, for the rest of your life. So we did a study um, a few years ago that took patients with so-called recovered dilated cardiomyopathy. These were patients who were very well, who, who, who felt back to normal. And we did a study where we took a half of them off their medications and the other half stayed on their medications. Okay. And about four out of ten of those who came off their medications had a reduction in their heart function um, and, and had what we termed was a relapse of, of their dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. So I think it is better to consider this a remission of your cardiomyopathy, a remission of heart failure, rather than a cure or a, a recovery. And, and this is something that we hope to do more work on to try to work out which medications are the most important to maintain this remission in the long term and give patients the best quality of life. So what about exercise? So I think exercise is a super important thing. It's something we should all talk to our patients about. It's something that you should all talk to your doctors about. Okay, exercise is good and we want to enable you to try to do the exercise that you want to do provided it doesn't cause undue risk. Okay, so this slide shows lots of different types of exercises. Okay, the ones in green are low intensity exercises. The ones in yellow are moderate intensity exercises and the ones in red are high intensity exercises. And in general, if you have dilated cardiomyopathy, you can do low to moderate intensity exercise. Okay? Under some very specific circumstances, we may permit some patients to do more intensive exercise, but this is only after specialist assessment and if, if, if there are specific conditions fulfilled. So what is low to moderate intensity exercise? Well, it's all those in green or yellow. Um, and if we want to, some patients want as much information as possible. They want to take as, you know, as a, a lot of control over what they do. So they want, you know, what should my maximum target heart rate be, doctor? Well, generally, low, low to moderate intensity exercise is reaching about 75% of your maximum uh, heart rate. And that tends to be around 120 beats per minute, although it might be slightly lower if you're older, it might be slightly higher if you're younger. What about alcohol? And, and this is an interesting one. Uh, excessive consumption causes dilated cardiomyopathy. Excessive consumption is drinking 40 to 50 units of alcohol a week. Okay. The effects of moderate consumption are less clear. Okay. And in people, the effect in, in some people, the effect of moderate consumption may be greater than others. If you have a vulnerable heart, it may be that you, you know slightly less alcohol. Um, it, it, it does have an effect on, on, on your heart, but generally, small amounts of alcohol each week, you know, uh, uh, you know, are not going to have a big effect. And I think most of us um, would would you know would be happy to to you know, to, to recommend that, that low to moderate amounts, um, you know, are acceptable and probably don't have a huge risk. The, the one circumstance where I think alcohol abstinence can be helpful is if you've had atrial fibrillation and you've had a treatment to cardiovert your heart back into the normal rhythm. And there was a trial in Australia recently that showed that, that, that impressively got half of Australians in this study to remain abstinent from alcohol for um, nine months. And it showed that those that remained abstinent had a 
reduction in the recurrence of atrial fibrillation. So I think this is the one circumstance where I have a conversation with patients to say, you know, ha have a think about this. Absence from alcohol might be a good thing. What about pregnancy? So cardiomyopathy might present during pregnancy, um, and that might be because a woman has had a pre-existing dilated cardiomyopathy that pregnancy has unmasked, or it might be peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is a, a form of dilated cardiomyopathy that is caused or at least contributed to by, um, by, by, by pregnancy and, and the processes associated with pregnancy. I think if, if women with dilated cardiomyopathy wish to become pregnant, it's essential that they have pre-pregnancy counselling by, um, by specialist services to understand the risks of pregnancy, both to them and their baby, and, and to plan the best way to do this. So informed decision-making is, is, is really key, and I think having discussions with young women um, from a very early stage is, is very important. And if we are um, planning pregnancy, then we need to think about stopping these medications, which can be harmful to the baby um, as it develops. So these should ideally be stopped prior to conception. Okay, I'm just going to finish with two things that I'd like to emphasize. So um, lots of us um, with, within the charity have been contributing to something called um, a priority setting partnership. I think you've got lots of information about this on your tables. So this is when we're trying to um, ask patients, their carers, healthcare professionals for their views about what we should make as um, priorities for the research that we do in the future. We want you to help us ask the right questions so that we can improve the care of you and your loved ones. Um, so I think your opinion is, is incredibly important and I'd really urge you to complete the, the survey um, that, 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 that is currently online. And the other thing is, if you're interested in research, then please get in touch. There's, there's lots of information in the Cardmopathy UK um, um, website and, and newsletters about possible studies. And you can also find other studies in the Heart Hive, which um, mm. my colleague James Ware will tell you a little bit about later on. It's a patient portal that gives you information about research studies that are happening around the country and that you can sign uh, up, up, up to. So, um, I will stop talking and um, allow you to ask some questions, um, and I'll hopefully be able to answer them. Thank you very much, Brian. And um, I'm sure... I'm, I'm sure colleagues, uh, everybody with us today, will feel that they've gained a lot, both those of who are just finding out about it, but also those who actually thought we knew about it, but I've got new things to think about. Um, if, have we got a mic at the back and anybody to manoeuvre that? I think we've got a volunteer, well done, one of my fellow trustees. Um, I'd ask you to wait if you could until the mic comes to you and I'll, move them, I'll come down and take the mic in the other direction. It's just that the acoustics here. First. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could tell us whether there are any opportunities um, within research that AI might be going to uh, help you with or that people are interested in? Yes, no, absolutely. So um, AI is, a, you know, is, is an exploding area in research. We already use it to analyze our MRI scans. I, I, I think the, the real you know, immediate benefit that we can try to use it for is, is to try to classify different forms of dilated cardiomyopathy. So dilated cardiomyopathy is, you know, a family of different diseases. It's, you know, a, a mixing pot of different things. And it may be that specific forms of the disease can be, should be treated in different ways than others. So trying to classify it based on lots of routine information that we have about different patients, I think, you know, I, is an area of interest for lots of people, and I think one that you know we will see more and more. Thank you. We've one at the back here. There we go. I'm going to get your steps into the game. Thank you. 
Hi. I hate asking questions at these things. Um, so I thought it was really interesting what you said about um, various treatments for dilated cardiomyopathy. And I'm not currently on any medication, but um, do you think it's beneficial for everyone that has um, DCM to be on some form of medication to take a load off the heart? So a, a good question, and, and I, you know, hand on heart, I don't think anyone has, you know, the information to 100%, you know, tell people, you know, with, with very, very early forms of the disease that medications medications we use to treat heart failure are going to, you know, improve lives in the future. We just don't have that evidence at the moment. It's something that I'm interested in and want to do more and more research on. Um, so, you know, whenever I have patients with who are well, who have subtle changes in their heart function, maybe with a family history of cardiomyopathy, you know, I have a conversation um, about the possible benefits they may get. Um, you know, also with the impact of taking medications on their life, their thoughts, their perspective. You know, some of these medications, um, you know, do influence choices around pregnancy and conception. And for, you know, for young women, that these are important things for us to talk about. Um, so, you know, it is a difficult one. And I think we don't have the same type of evidence that we have for people with more severe disease. And... It's, you know, an evolving area um, and everyone does it slightly differently. <laughs> um, I've just recently been diagnosed and um, one of the things that I was also interested in was the medicine side of things. And if you go back to your lovely slide, which shows the four things, um, yep. I think load, speed, um, it's a really good slide, but what I'd be interested in you sort of talking a bit more about it, because everybody I've spoken to so far seems to be on completely different medication to me. Yeah. Um, I don't know, sorry, did I move my... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so that would be really good to just talk through the types of medications and yeah. what they do. Yeah. Whether that's too detailed a question, apologies for that. Uh, no. So... so uh, uh, the, the four classes of medications are effectively known um, w w within the cardiology community as the FAB4. Um, and the FAB4 essentially are either ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, or sacubital valsartan, also known as Entresto. Okay. So that is one class of medication. So typically we'll try to get all patients on one of these if they present with heart failure and reduced heart function. Um, then mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, which are either spironolactone or a plerinone, okay, um, and and beta blockers, okay, and 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 then also SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, within the ACE inhibitor, angiotensin receptor blocker, and angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor, there's about 15 different types of medication, or w within those class that different people will use. Okay, um, and the same with beta blockers. There's maybe about five or six different beta blockers that we can use. Different people have different favourite ones. Um, it may be that hospital formularies or GP formularies will prefer one than over the other. Um, so there is variation in the you know in the specific medications within those classes that are prescribed. At the back. Thank you. Just repeat that for those who haven't heard, uh, that some of the medications are older, some of them are newer, and does that make... Yeah, so enalapril was probably the first medication that we investigated back in, you know, the late 70s, early 80s. You know, it's still incredibly effective and, you know, probably as effective as every other ACE inhibitor that there is, if not more effective. Um, so some are old, some are newer. Um, Secudral valsartan is... Uh, I suppose you could look at it as a super powered type of angiotensin receptor blocker. It's an angiotensin receptor blocker with an extra medication added in. Um, you know, the trial for that that was published back in 2016, so it's a newer medication. The SGLT2 inhibitors are a new class of medication that's been used for the last three years. Um, 
So, you know, just, just because they're new doesn't mean that they're better than the older ones. Thank you. At the back, thank you. Uh, hello, yeah. Um, so my wife has had uh, low heart function, 35% for a couple of years, but isn't presenting with any heart failure at all. So two questions. One is, how can that be so? And secondly, how do you advise patients that are measuring low function yet otherwise feel so well? Yeah, so it, it's a good question. You know, you look at some people's heart scans and you think, you know, you know, how can you be doing the amount of exercise that you're doing? And you know, it it is a bit of a marvel. You can you can have people with you know mildly impaired heart function who, um, you know, who have very severe symptoms. So. Heart function doesn't necessarily always correlate particularly well with symptoms. I, I think certainly if you are asymptomatic, if you're without symptoms, and if your natriuretic peptide levels, so um, a heart failure biomarker in the blood are low, then that puts you in a very, you know, you know, in, in a good category in terms of risk of future things. Okay, compared to someone who's symptomatic or with high natriuretic peptide levels. So. Um, we do recognise this happens. Um, people can compensate very well for reduced heart function. Um, if the right hand side of the heart functions well, then that can often, you know, mask reduced heart function on the left. It can help people cope better. Um, so we recognise that it happens, um, and I think treatment of truly asymptomatic people is, you know, is something we don't have a huge amount of evidence for. But equally, I think, you know, if the ejection fraction is 35%, you know, most people would advocate treatment of that with, with, um, with, you know, with, with standard heart failure therapy. I think in these circumstances, it can also be helpful to put people on a treadmill and, you know, get them to exercise and see how much exercise they can really do. A cardiopulmonary exercise test is often helpful to measure cardiovascular exercise capacity and the amount of oxygen you consume. Um, and all of these, you know, can help tailor things a little bit. But I think, you know, if someone is well with, you know, low heart failure biomarkers in the blood, that's a, you know, a good thing. Yes. Hello. Sorry. Uh, you've, you've just answered part of my question. But like the previous lady, I'm quite new to this, like, the last five months. Um, and I was interested that you were talking a lot more about the MRI scan because I had one originally, but going forward, um, that's not mentioned. It's more an echo cardiogram. Yeah. I do have a very low ejection, 20, 23%. Um, and I'm not really sure, you know, in terms of going forward, how often that will be monitored. Will it be MRIs? Should one look at a more specialist heart hospital than one that I'm under or something like that? It's, it's knowing sort of which channel to take. Yeah. Really. So I, I think the benefit from the, the, the biggest benefit from an MRI is at the start of things to get us a picture of the disease, to get us, you know, answers do you have a lot of scar in your heart? Um, what are the chances of things getting better? If there's no scar in the heart with medications, I would be hopeful that we see improvement in the heart function and improvement in symptoms. I, I think the benefit of having, you know, serial MRIs over follow-up, you know, is is smaller, and you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so I. In many circumstances, and it, it depends a little bit on patients, I, I do not like getting inside MRI scanners. Um, so, you know, I, I would be happy to monitor the heart function with an echocardiogram. The echo, an echocardiogram is a good measure of heart function. And with, you know, echocardiograms over time, then, you know, we can get an idea of trajectory and where things are going. So I think the biggest benefit from an MRI is at the start. And I think, you know, following things after that with an echocardiogram is certainly a very reasonable thing to do. You know, it, it, in, in places like America, you know, some places, you know, will not do as frequent echocardiograms as, you know, as, as perhaps are done here. And they will go more on the symptoms of patients and how they're doing. 
Um, so, you know, I, I tend to monitor function over time, and, and I think, you know, serial echocardiography is a reasonable way to do that. Uh, hi there. Um, hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you mentioned that um, targeted treatment is still in the research phase at the moment, and you mentioned around about five years. I know everyone's talking about Mavcampton and HCM at the moment, and how that works. It's a mice in inhibitor. Um, I was just wondering what would be the mechanism behind the DCM yep. drugs? So, good, good question. So, one of the trials that we're involved in at the moment is essentially the opposite of Mavacampton. So in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, the little muscle fibers inside our heart work over time. Okay, so it is, causes hypercontractility. The heart works too much. And in dilated cardiomyopathy, it's the exact opposite. The muscle fibers work less. Okay, and the same genes that are affected in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can also be affected to cause dilated cardiomyopathy if the spelling mistake in the gene causes the opposite thing to happen, okay? So if it causes the muscle fibers to work less. So in, with Mavicampton, we're trying to calm everything down, okay? And that's why we're inhibiting things. And in specific forms of dilated cardiomyopathy, where there's underaction of the muscle fibers, we may be able to activate things. So we're looking at something called a cardiac myosin activator in people with specific genetic forms of dilated cardiomyopathy that we think may respond best to this type of therapy. And there, there, there are other therapies based on other genetic changes that have been under investigation and that will be under investigation that work in other specific ways. I hope that made sense. Um, Gentlemen here, um, we are coming to the end of it. I'm trying to Yes, of course, so please come and ask me questions. On the subject of pacemakers and the, the future, um, I think there's a company called Medtronic that now has a miniaturised pacemaker that can be inserted yep. into the thigh and then secured inside the heart. Is that going to be possible for all types of CR? Included re resynchronization. Yep. So, uh, th th lots of different companies are coming up with their own micro pacemakers. So these are little, you know, devices the size of a paper clip that essentially will sit inside the heart. They don't have leads. They don't have any boxes here. Um, and there's lots of studies underway about how we can use them for cardiac resynchronization therapy. There's some studies looking to link them up with the subcutaneous defibrillator. Okay, so the subcutaneous defibrillator is the one that doesn't have any leads inside the heart. It, the advantage of that is, you know, is, is exactly that. It can't pace the heart though, so could we pair that up to provide protection to people from dangerous heart rhythms and then also be able to pace their heart by making it talk to one of these tiny little devices that sits inside the ventricle. So I think that's something we will, we will see more of. Um, these micro pacemakers are being used and implanted um, at the moment, although it's still quite early days. They're not probably within the NHS. Yeah, no, so in the NHS they're being implanted. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, first, thank you very much for your presentation, extremely informative. Um, I've got a question very specifically about genetic testing. Um, my biological father had DCM, and um, I was diagnosed in September 21. Um, however, when I had my genetic testing, it came back as inconclusive. And I'm quite curious to know if you know the criteria for the difference between a definite no and an inconclusive, because I feel kind of like I'm in limbo. Because yeah, I'm so, really curious to know what has caused this. So we can get different answers whenever we do genetic testing. Okay, we, we try to classify how co our confidence and whether a genetic change is the cause of someone's disease. Okay, and this is on the background of us each having thousands of changes in our genetic makeup, and we ask our genetic lab to try to interpret these thousands of changes 
and to try to pick the one that may be causing the disease. So genetic testing isn't a yes or no answer, it's a probabilistic answer. And we go from a kind of 0%, this is very unlikely to be the cause of the disease, to close to 100%, this is almost certainly the cause of the disease. We know lots of other people with exactly the same type of cardiomyopathy who have this change in the gene, and no one without a cardiomyopathy has this change in the gene. So there are something called the ACMG criteria that are genetic labs used to interpret the changes in genes, um, and they help us estimate the probability of a change in a, in a gene causing a disease. The problem, if, if we're 70% sure that something might be the cause of the disease, there's still that doubt. And that, it, it, the, the main benefit of doing genetic testing is then being able to test other family members to see if they may also be at risk. The problem with using a gene that we're not particularly confident is the cause of the disease may be that we then incorrectly release someone from follow-up who may still actually be at risk of developing disease in the future. There are things that we can do to increase our confidence of a change in a gene being the cause of a problem, and that's mainly by trying to test other family members with and without the disease and, and ensuring that it segregates or only incurs in those individuals with the disease and not in those individuals without the disease. So genetic testing is changing all the time. If you do have a test, I think it's you know, good to remind your doctor that you had a test five years ago. We may have more evidence in the literature about, you know, uh, that, that supports the pathogenicity, the, 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 the strength of evidence to suggest this is a cause. And it's always good to relook to see whether we can increase our confidence in, in the genetic change. You know, every five years or so. The, the other thing is that the, the types of genetic tests we do evolve, and some genes that we test for now, we didn't test for five years ago, okay? So it, it may be that we decide to update your test or do a newer type of test that maybe includes a slightly different um, number of genes.